Thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon for developing a data-driven approach to organizational development. If you're looking for another topic, you might be in the wrong room. I hope everybody takes a moment to stretch themselves out in their seats as we get started, since it is the afternoon. Um, and we're here to talk to you about a topic that Jackie and I care a great deal about. So we'll get started. Um, Jackie, over, Jackie Lorraine oversees Washington University Library's administrative functions, including HR, organizational learning, finance, assessment, building operations, and communications. And she also teaches organizational behavior and development to MBA students at the Maryville University Simon School of Business. Jackie brings over two decades of organizational leadership experience in higher ed, state government, and the nonprofit sector. And I'm Kristen Curian. I'm Skill Types Chief Operating Officer, and I lead product and customer success and I bring to that more than two decades of academic library experience. I was formerly the AUL for data and operations in the Boston University Libraries, where I was responsible for talent. And I worked in the MIT libraries for more than 20 years, leading departments responsible for innovative projects and advancing organizational effectiveness, everything from digitization to software de development and UX. So what we have for you today is beginning with an overview of the talent ecosystem for libraries. It's complicated, exciting, and interesting. And we will also talk about ways in which tools like the skill type platform can help in this ecosystem to make skills data visible. Jackie will pro provide an overview of examples of approaches taken by a real library, Washington University and St. Louis, to take on data-driven approaches to developing skills and making the best of their organization. We've allocated time for questions at the end. Please use the microphone for your questions. And we are here because the challenges facing libraries are so vast and they can be lessened with timely actionable data that treats the library's most precious collection, its people, with the respect and care and rigor it deserves. So here we go. So the digital skills landscape is one that's always changing. So the shelf life of skills in 2017 was estimated to be about five years. In the recent years, it's far less than three years, and I'm not sure any of us in this room a year ago might have heard of large language models or chat GPT. The HR talent data that we have to work with is often fragmented, incomplete or stale, trapped across spreadsheets, file stores, and memories. Hiring and retention are highly competitive right now, and the top people that are working in library organizations are there because they choose to be. All the stakeholders within the ecosystem expect more of one another, whether that's a library leader who's trying to respond to a provost request to advance data science on their campus with a flat head count or a few additional resources, or the staff and managers who are seeking ways to grow. There's hope on the horizon in terms of certificates, micro-credentials, fellowships, and practice-based opportunities that can bring needed ex expertise and diversity to the industry and also continue to, to advance the learning after someone earns an MLIS, or for those who've never had the opportunity to do so due to cost or lack of access. Strategic plans are highlighting skill development to realize vision and values and to deliver world-class experiences, and library leadership roles focused on people development are growing as well. In a time when collections, general collections, are increasingly shared at scale, Skills and expertise in the people in a library can be a key differentiator that distinguishes a library between other partners on campus or other libraries down the street. So within this complex landscape, having access and information about the capabilities of people to calibrate planning can really provide a lot of flexibility for leaders and responsiveness to change. This is an area where skill type as a platform can help. So some of you may be familiar with skill type from prior CNI brief briefings by Tony Zanders, for example, who was here in 2021 talking about the global skills library economy. If you're not familiar, skill types platform was founded in 2018 and is a growing global community with more than 130 organizations and more than 3000 users that includes academic libraries, public libraries, I schools and consortia. It's powered by a library specific control vocabulary and data model that standardizes skills, job roles, the products that are used in libraries, organizations, associations, and vendors, and links those to curated trading content, as well as actionable cur current insights for leaders to plan, 
for managers to manage and bring out the best in their staff, and for individuals to take an active role in growing their own careers. When we're talking about data-informed organizational development, it's drawing on a long history of libraries curating their collections with care, rigor, and discipline, and analysis, and applying that to the capabilities of the people in the library. It's not a passive thing that administration is responsible for. Everyone in this data-informed ecosystem, including individual staff, have access to data about their own skills, about the kinds of jobs that their skills may link to, that may be within their current work or related work that they never thought of before within the information professions. Team managers are able to align a group's skills with the priorities and values of the organization. And they can have authentic conversations based on people's interests and prior experience about the work that they might be ready to do. This can make equitable access to professional development and training more possible and opportunities for growth more accessible for the people that may have been left out in the past. And for leaders, having a standardized dashboard of talent needs to understand how to allocate vacancies when positions are empty and how to adapt current roles to needs is a key component in being able to evolve the library forward. When it's time for recruitment, there's a suite of options that involve developing staff internally, finding people who may be ready to step up or have articulated an interest in a particular area, and external recruitment that complements the skills that already exist in the library. And this is some of what Jackie Lorraine and the team at Washington University Libraries in St. Louis are doing. So now we'll hear a case study about how data-informed organizational development works in practice. Thanks, Jackie. Hello, and thank you all again for being here. Um, I will share some of the work with you that we're doing at Washington University Libraries, and uh, afterwards I look forward to answering as many of your questions as I can, and hopefully also learn, learning more from you. A little background about the libraries at WashU. We have a total of nine locations and we have an operating budget of about $32 million. Our organizational structure and um, leadership consists of the Office of the Vice Provost and University Librarian, which is led by Mimi Coulter, and our Chief of Staff, who oversees our administrative support, donor engagement, and grants program. We have five distinct and integrated divisions, which include digital scholarship and technology services, research and academic collaboration services, collection management and access services, special collections, and the division which I oversee, planning operations and administrative services. Our staffing profile consists of approximately 140 FTEs. 60% of those positions are professional positions and 40% are non-exempt or paraprofessional professional roles. We have approximately 80 student employees and this staffing profile has shifted significantly over the years. Um, specifically related to student positions. We've had almost 200 positions when I first joined the libraries nine years ago, and we're moving toward more strategic and specialized roles. And I'll share more about how that has changed and why that has changed as we go on in the presentation. On the screen, you'll see our mission, organizational principles, and our strategic priorities that drive our current organizational development activities and those we've been involved in over the past five or six years. Although the mission and principles were established under a previous leader, we continue to evolve by prioritizing career, team, and organizational development activities with our strategic priorities, including collaboration, collections, and infrastructure. And these are also aligned with the university pillars of academic distinction, DEI, and a research focus. Some of our data-driven organizational development activities have included state interviews, which are one-on-one -on -one meetings to get feedback about the individual and their role in the organization. It has helped us to understand individual career and professional goals, provide leaders with data to identify, to identify um, growth opportunities and staff, led, um, and staff to lead projects and initiatives. It also keeps staff engaged and helps us to increase staff retention. Can everyone hear me okay? Our professional development and performance management focus has been driven to uh, help to drive organizational effectiveness and excellence. Our professional development um, is built into job expectations and job descriptions for each role. Despite budget cuts, we've continued to invest in professional development support for our staff at all levels of the organization. 
We've established managerial competencies such as communication, leadership, and planning, as well as staff values, which include balance, collaboration, dedication, which are written into our performance expectations to ensure everyone is focused on personal, organizational goals and priorities, as well as leadership development. We have conducted a workforce analysis, which was a holistic approach to identifying strategic positions needed to help our organization meet evolving needs. Through that process, we identify internal candidates and redefine roles to meet those needs and address critical demands. We also um, a, a appropriately define student level work. Our student workers, this study that we did with our student worker uh, program resulted in approximately $200,000 that was redistributed in our compensation budget to toward more strategic positions or to help establish new FTEs for essential services. Our staff retention have efforts have been a collaboration between the university and the libraries to increase, to increase salaries to appropriate market levels, especially for positions with specialized skills and are hard to fill. We have also um, promoted uh, people and upgraded positions to appropriate grade levels based on the current work and activities that they're doing and organizational demands. Um, participating in multi-year planning projects with our overall budget structure and staffing. This is, um, includes forecasting long-term staffing and budgetary requirements to meet research, teaching, and technology and digital transformation needs. As part of our annual budget process, we identify priority roles, request new headcounts, and are look for opportunities to repurpose positions if possible when vacancies occur. We've also shifted our recruitment practices to focus on skills and experience rather than types of degrees and degree levels for certain positions. We've re rewritten job descriptions with a broader scope to attract more diverse applicant pools and creating greater access for job seekers with critical needs um, that, that uh, we need in our organization. We've partnered with staffing agencies and organizations like LaunchCo, which is a nonprofit that helps people enter into the technology field. Through this work, we've identified staff from non-traditional backgrounds to fill developer and system engineer roles and create a more diverse staffing profile within our technology services department. We've continued the work of realigning departments and workflows to increase organizational effectiveness. Each AUL engages in regular assessments with their divisions to understand challenges and opportunities. And most of those assessments have resulted in redistribution, redistribution of work, redesigned or newly um, formed uh, departments and positions. We've also developed business process improvement projects, which has engaged different departments throughout the organization to examine our internal business practices to minimize silos and streamline our business operations. We also have created an internal expertise survey, which, is geared, which was geared towards supporting life cycles of faculty research and teaching. And this was initiated to address the research needs identified by our stakeholders via campus-wide survey from our previous strategic plan. And our goals with this survey were to identify expert roles and staff levels of expertise, develop a mechanism for users to um, identify um, appropriate experts, in our organization and provide a template for library staff to develop expertise. This project was perfectly aligned with skill type and we used the platform to meet our initial lead of establishing a talent management process. Mm -hmm. The skill type was implemented as a catalyst for building sufficient organizational capacity and creating a learning organization. And part of the process was establishing guidelines for managers to make the most of uh, skill types use. Skill type is currently fully integrated into our one-on-one uh, one -on -one onboarding process, and it is highlighted in our library's one-on-one -on -one program, which we established to introduce staff to the full scope of our organizational operation and the library's role within the university so that staff who are not familiar with the academic library community can feel informed, included, and engaged. Skill type is also aligned with our commitment to create opportunities for continuous staff development and we use skill type, and the use of skill type has been incorporated into our professional development policy. This work has resulted in a pilot project with Amigos where our skill type data is being used to identify broader training needs and develop future programming. Looking ahead, some of the projects that we are working on related to our strategic priorities and the university strategic plan 
include it includes our digital infrastructure and digital infrastructure strategy and our digital library roadmap, which was established and led by my colleague Harriet Green. This is a multi-year strategy to expand technology infrastructure, implement new digital tools, and expand services for data-driven research. And it's also tied to the university's goal to leverage digital solutions to advance studies in areas such as AI and social sciences. We've recently um, established our idea statement, which, which is inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. And our next steps is to creating goals and objectives for advocacy, collections, spaces, and inclusive organizational culture. Um, a result, um, another initiative related to IDEA is continuing developing new internships to expose students of color and graduates of the university's prison education program to our organization and library science profession. We're continuing to increase staff capacity in areas such as instruction, metadata, and digital preservation. And we've recently recruited a new assessment role that is focused on data analytics and data visualization. And we're currently using other assessment tools like the ARL Project Outcomes, ACRL Benchmark, ARL Research and Assessment Cycle Toolkit, university-initiated university initiated surveys, to identify opportunities to enhance our services and improve our overall impact. We are continually working with um, the skill, uh, skill type platform to bridge gaps to customize opportunities and training. Through increased usage and updates to profiles, we are hoping to provide greater insight into our organizational skill capacity. We are having a renewed focus on individual interests and team management so that managers have the ability to assess needs and identify training opportunities, and we are also exploring new use cases with our student advisory group, donors, and internal committees to try to identify user needs and expertise alignment. So back over to you, Christine. Well, thanks, Jackie, for that great update from Washington University in St. Louis. I think that one of the important pieces of this is that the work of developing a healthy organization, it's alive and it continues to grow. So you can't quite just check it off as being done. And uh, Washington University libraries have made a lot of progress. So we're now at the point of Q&A. So we have a few questions to leave with the group. We also are happy to take your questions, but I think overall, how might we advance knowledge in our communities through data-driven organizational development? Um, what types of expertise differentiate your organization or do you like your organization to be known for? And what are some of the ways that you could start modeling skills and capacity today? So we are happy to take your questions or your responses to these prompts. We're really grateful to be here. And you can also reach out to us after this, too. So thank you for your, uh, for your listening and your patience. Please bring us your questions at the microphone. Thank you for your talk. I'm Jamie Wittenberg from CU Boulder Libraries. I'm curious about the response that you've had among your staff implementing these data-driven organizational development strategies. I'm particularly interested whether there's been a negative response related to professional development and skills training or information being shared with third parties um, or that data being monetized in some way by third parties. And I'm curious what your licenses look like when you negotiate terms with those organizations. Do you want to take the first part about adoption, Jackie, and then I can talk about privacy and how we protect people's data? Sure, yes. We've had an um, um, open, you know, and We've had an open process to our professional development. The implementation of skill type and other professional development opportunities, we've had buy-in from our middle managers and our leadership team before we've rolled it out to all staff. We make sure that everyone is informed about any changes that we're making. And so we've had a pretty open process for that. And so I think that's helped with our communication. I think uh, there's more work that we can do to make sure that people understand what's involved or what's what's out there in the skill type platform and how it can meet their individual needs and how we can better utilize it. But we've been pretty open to staff with their ideas. If they find a training or workshop that they want to go to, we've identified funds to try to uh, make sure that everyone has the type of professional development opportunities that they need. So 
Thanks, Jackie. Mm -hmm. uh, Skill type works with a variety of libraries, and so we have adoption rates that range from 50% to, I think Jackie had mentioned, 85%, 85 for the staff. A lot, and a lot of that tone is set by the leaders in the organization and how they set up skill type and the kind of value it can deliver. So making professional development available to all members of the staff, people who may not be able to travel, et cetera, can be an equalizer. And it can also be one to, uh, I worked in libraries where people didn't know what they needed to do to be successful. So creating some of that information where it's clear what's expected and how people can grow is a component of setting up skill type or other tools for adoption. I've also worked on a lot of IT projects, and I'm sure people in this room have done ILS migrations and so on. And people have a, a healthy level of skepticism whenever they're asked to go through anything that's new or change. The other component um, to your question, and thank you for asking it, about how, the, how data access is controlled and so on, um, is something that we're actually very proud of and we've worked really hard on. So individuals that are uh, invited to join skill type with your library, your, your, the data stays with your library. And so individuals are able to see who in the organization can access their data. And if they want to connect to other organizations that aren't your library, they do that through opting in. The skill type data set isn't shared with any additional third parties. And so all of this information is transparent. And if you're a skill type user or you've seen the platform from the, the three dots menu on the upper right, there's a privacy check and folks can see who, um, what roles in their library are able to see data about them. My skills data, for example, Tony, who's in the back row, is my boss. And so he can see the trainings that, um, the, the type of trainings I've done from our control vocabulary and the topics. And he can see that I, I watched 60 videos in the last 180 days. But he doesn't know when I did it. And he's not able to download any information about what those trainings are or what, at what time. As an individual, I can do that myself. And then I have a record of something that I can send to Tony or a peer of like, hey, these were all the trainings or things that I've learned in the past six months. That can save me some time in my performance review, but I have control over that data. And so my team manager, um, in the way that we set up the platform, and I don't want to get into too much detail about it, but I'm happy to talk to you about it later, um, we have controls in place so that the right people have access to the data. And that's, about, that's up to the library when they work with us to set it up. But we've, we've worked pretty hard, I think, on our privacy policy. We're open to feedback about it. But all of it is transparent. All of those policies are transparent and visible to the people. But you've pointed out a really important part of adoption. So thanks for asking your question. Thank you very much. And when we implemented skill type, we did have our, um, our university attorneys look at the policy. And, and they, they looked at all the, the information to make sure that it was you know, in line with the university practices. So we did go the extra mile to make sure that everything was protected and in line with that. More questions? You couldn't hear me? No. Oh. Want to try again? What, my last statement? Or just in general? Just what you mentioned, something about following the... The university's uh, guidelines. Yeah, we, we did have the university's um, Office of General Counsel look at our, our contracts and agreements with skill type before we implemented it. Hi there. I'm curious if you have any data on, you know, what has happened since you've done this in terms of retention, you know, <clears throat> have less people left? Um, have more people been promoted? Um, are people going places and for different reasons? You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, what kind of assessment have you done since? Well, we have ongoing assessment in that space, but um, after the pandemic, we've had a record number of recruitment. So one fourth of our staff is fairly new. So it's hard to gauge retention. We have so many new people. We don't, ex we've had some turnover in the last year, but it's been uh, minimal in comparison to previous years um, where we've had a lot of retirements and, and things like that. But we've had um, lots of internal promotions and we're doing more of that. Um, whether it's been redefining their roles or when we've had a position that has opened and we've 
recruited internally. And some of those have been appointments and some of those have been where they've had to compete, you know, in a national search. So um, I don't have specific numbers, but I know that um, overall we've been more intentional about internal promotions and ensuring that people have other opportunities for advancement within our organization. Does that answer your question? All right, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm curious if you can talk a bit about the data that you're collecting on expertise and is that self-identified by people in your library? Is there some kind of assessment that you're doing to see like, is this person truly an expert in X thing um, and how you're tracking that? So the, the initial survey that we did before we implemented skill type was to um, identify levels of expertise. Is this person a novice? Do they you know, know how to do advanced? Uh, do they have advanced skills in particular areas? And that was the uh, initial um, concept that we, we implemented with that survey. But that, is, that work is still being done, so we don't have any specific data about or any internal tests about people's level of assessment. We have done skills testing with people that we have recruited externally for certain positions, and we have done skills assessments to ensure that they have um, the necessary things that we need them to do. So we have done that in, in the recruitment process, but we have not done a, a broader range of assessment about internal skills within our organization at this point. And speaking from libraries that we work with on the skill type platform, we get this question a lot about what does it really mean to have a skill or an expertise? Mm -hmm. And so this is a, this is a situation where um, within the platform, we've implemented professional competency standards from a variety of organizations, ALA, ACRL, and more. And those standards for competency are themselves a little dusty at times. Mm -hmm. And uh, who, gets, who judges a person's level of competency or their ability to do their job is highly subjective. And so the software doesn't, doesn't grade or judge people, but it starts by asking the question, what, do you, what are you good at? What do you do every day in your job? And with some of the customers we work with, that may be the first time that the staff have ever been asked that question. And so um, we start by allowing people to self-identify the skills that they have, and then that can power the ongoing management and conversations that people have about strengths and weaknesses and areas for folks to grow. But it, it's something that, um, that people ask about a lot, and they think that we might want to it might be too small of a question about what does it mean to be a librarian now? What are the skills that are needed? How do we bring those out in people and develop them? So I'm really glad that you asked the question, but I think that there's a lot more to it than we can get into in the remainder of the session. So I'm gonna ask a question even though I think you probably just touched upon on, on the response. I was gonna ask about sort of what types of um, credentialing really exists within the program and how are you assessing that the person actually achieves the skills that um, they're trying to learn in order to advance either in the organization or elsewhere? I think that would tie into the existing workflows in the organization about how skills are evaluated and judged. Uh, I think this will be something that will always be judged by the people that are closest to the situation. And there are some, some software for learning management, for example, that, tr that implement a standard of competency, but whether that standard is relevant to the situation that a particular library is in at a given time you know, remains to be seen. So I think there's work that could be done with this and there are types of certificates that are coming out of information school programs that could also be followed too. Thanks for the question. Hi, I'm Karen Eslin, she, her from Colorado State University. Uh, thank you for your presentation and I'm gonna follow up a little bit on what Trevor was talking about by asking specifically about the manager competencies because mm. as you mentioned the data-driven development in my organization manager competencies is the top issue people leave um, we have lots of uh, sending them to a traditional HR training has not worked right. um, so I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what are those manager competencies and how have you integrated that into your organizational development process Jackie um, I, I named a few of them. Um, when we implemented it, um, we established 
the competencies and then we gave specific examples. We created a grid with specific examples of what that would look like, organizational planning. And each um, quarter or each time we do a um, performance management, go through our performance management process, on the self-evaluation, the managers have to include how have they met this particular objective or competency or goal, um, and those are built into we into that specific um, performance management uh, form for managers. So we have one specifically for managers, and those are managerial competencies, but also our staff values are built into that. And then we have one that is that is just organizational competencies or things you need to be successful in our organization. So that's done separately. But planning, communication, leadership, I don't know them all by heart, I'm sorry. Um, but specific examples, like I said, a grid that shows this is what leadership looks like. This is what effective communication looks like. You know, meeting with your staff or... Um, um, making sure that you set performance expectations and, you know, um, having balance and making sure there's equitable work within your department so so that they have a clear understanding of what we mean by leadership. And then if we feel that someone isn't meeting that expectation, then we identify, you know, training, whether it's um, internally, you know, uh, through our SHU or another organization to help the person development and and then ongoing coaching so I would say across the platform some of the data modeling we're starting to do with uh, what are the competencies related to management are also touching on things such as intercultural fluency effective collaboration managing projects or services or using data to understand how an organization and a library works that perspective of assessment and understanding the impact of what's going on is starting to bubble up in terms of the interests and the skills that are being identified by both library organizations on our platform and individual library professionals too. So we hope to do more of that modeling over, over time. But I would hypothesize that what a manager needs to do today is probably a lot different than five years ago, particularly if you're dealing with hybrid or remote staff or other kinds of situations around really distributing work equitably. So there's lots more to be done there, but managers are such a key component of being able to realize priorities, and sometimes they don't get very much attention. They kind of live in that middle where everybody wants something from them. So they can at least have some current tools and training and support in an environment like WashU to be able to do more. I think we are at time. Please reach out to us if you have any further questions. We've really enjoyed being here today. And uh, go out and... We hope that you'll be able to think about the capacity and people in your library a little differently as a result of today. Bye-bye.